what a glorious morning that we're able to. That's been a, a process over the last three years of attempting to develop a global center for reparations organizing at the corner of Chicago and 38th. Um, to that end, uh, the panelists that are here today have made enormous contributions. So I'm going to call out people uh, individually, and we've had some discussion about the focus of each of these uh, faith-based organizations. So I think um, maybe we could start with Dana um, and talk about the work that um, Sacred Reckonings has done to develop a what's called an eco system for reparations. I'm actually going to turn this over to Rebecca to start us out. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Vogel, and I'm a Christian pastor in the United Church of Christ. And Dana and I and other colleagues have been working very closely on a program called Sacred Reckonings, which works with uh, predominantly and historically white Christian churches on the work of reparations. And I just want to, I'm, I'm going to turn it over, Dana's going to mostly be uh, the person talking, but I just wanted to set a little bit of context as to why our focus on white uh, Christian congregations. Um, and two points of contact. One is that many of us in 2016 um, I was uh, invited by Reverend Marlene Helgemo, a Ho-Chunk elder, to be a witness um, at Standing Rock. And in that, uh, in that time, there was, uh, in the beginning of November of 2016, there was a gathering of uh, about 525 uh, religious leaders uh, at Standing Rock to oppose the DAPL uh, pipeline and the primary ask was that we engage in the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that most of us in this room are familiar with that, but I just wanted to say one piece about it, and that is that it was a series, the doctrine of discovery was a series of letters from popes uh, starting in about the, the 1450s till the early 1500s that basically gave the theological um, underpinning and uh, uh, twisted logic that gave permission to European monarchs and peoples to engage in slaughter and forced conversion and enslavement of folks in, uh, at, in West Africa and then in, in North America. And, uh, and the, the logic of Christian and white supremacy that is blessed in those letters from popes to, Christian, to the Christian monarchs in Europe continue to form the theological basis and logic of white Christian supremacy today. So that's one point of reference. And the second point of reference is uh, in May of 1969, James Foreman uh, did a brilliant nonviolent direct action and took over the pulpit at Riverside Church in New York City and demanded $500 million in reparations from white Christian and Jewish congregations. There's much more context but with those two points of reference of the particular point of responsibility that white Christian churches hold. And we use the language of, of um, white settler colonizer churches hold. That is, that is some bit of the context as to why it is that our work at Sacred Reckonings is particularly um, focused on white settler colonizer churches doing reparations in relationship to uh, both American descendant of slave communities and indigenous communities. Thank you. Um, so you heard a little bit of uh, um, reference to some of our guiding assumptions, um, that being uh, the historical 
um, historically and predominantly white or white settler, uh, that's all now mouthful, white settler colonizer churches um, have a particular responsibility in this moment um, due to the connection to the doctrine of discovery and the, the uh, religious justification and blessing of the church. So um, we also recognize that reparations just as a concept um, spans a, a great, you know, there's a great deal of different opinions about what defines reparations. And we come to this work with the belief that reparations is actually multifaceted. And so we have a particular responsibility in um, these congregations, um, but it's not the only, our, our way is not the only way. Um, and that actually uh, our framework, I think, um, works well with both um, local and federal government initiatives um, and also like more hyper-local efforts. Um, so what you see on the screen there is what we refer to as the repertory eco map. And um, it's a five circle Venn diagram. Um, if you start at the, the top with truth telling, and go uh, clockwise around truth telling, spiritual practice, relationship, political solidarity, and wealth return. And just a point, the reason why we picture this as a Venn diagram is that not one individual circle itself is what we're calling reparation. That it's the, the yellow center where all five overlap is um, our framing for reparation. And friends, we've already experienced some powerful truth-telling and spiritual practice just here together uh, this morning. Um, but we start, it's not linear, that's why it's a circle, <laughs> and we invite people to continue around um, through their work over time. But um, because we start with that idea of the doctrine of discovery, um, and that theological justification for stolen land, stolen lives, and stolen labor. Um, and just to recognize that that is still functioning in our economic system, in our legal system, it's still, like, the, the underpinnings are still there. So it's not just this thing that lives in the past. It is a living um, uh, monster, really, in our systems. Extractive capitalism is really the fruit of that toxic theology. Um, we invite people to do societal level truth telling, um, denominational level truth telling, congregational level truth telling, and individual level truth telling. So we're inviting people to look critically at the story of how we got to this place and this time um, so that we can address that and be rooted in reality, not this myth of um, hyper-individualism, et cetera, et cetera. Spiritual practice is both um, an inoculation against um, being you know, stuck in kind of negative action, but also it invites us to dream prophetic dreams of what the reality could be. We know where we are, but we want to imagine something prophetic and liberative for all people. Um, and that's the part of the role of spiritual practice. Um, we include, um, because this is for Christian congregations, we include a stress on the Christian traditions that we already have available to us from various um, Christian practices of prayers of lament, um, services of confession, liturgies of grief, and all of that helps to kind of metabolize and um, give us energy for um, working through unwieldy feelings, because white folks can get a little stuck and immobilized by like feelings of guilt, um, and we don't we don't want folks to be stuck in guilt. Uh, guilt can be helpful, but as long as it's a motiv motiv motivation um, and something that we metabolize to move through, um, then it can be useful. Now, relationship um, is, we very specifically call it relationship, not relationships, to help differentiate between, this is not inviting every white congregation to have a black This is like, um, this is about not about um, exclusively interpersonal relationships, right? Um, this is about building
Drake, Orlando Castile, Jamar Clark, um, an acknowledgement of the institutional racism that is, we st still see to this day across the state of Minnesota. Um, and then also, I, I think this is the final piece, um, studying and distributing money, reparations, funds, so that communities can try to rebuild and we can move forward um, in this work. So that's at the state level. And then as was said at, in St. Paul, you know, I, I see you turn, we, we've worked very closely with you. Um, I'm thinking of our late executive director, um, Vic Rosenthal of, that, of, mess, of blessed memory. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get on the little here. But, um, you know, showing up at city commission meetings and organizing across congregations to get people involved. And then finally, I'm thinking not just about policy, but we go to congregations to try to get them to understand, you know, I think it comes to no surprise that the story of the Jewish people is the story of Exodus. And that story includes reparations. As the Jewish people are leaving, we collect gold and silver from the Egyptians. And that is a key part of justice, of liberation. Um, so we go to congregations and then we also um, hear back from congregations about the racial justice issues that they're interested in. Um, I'm thinking two o'clock today, um, the anti-racist group from my Rabin will be talking about Reconstructionist Judaism and how they came forward with a statement um, demanding reparations. So if you haven't seen that on your schedule, I highly suggest that you attend. Thanks so much, uh, Free Palestine, while we're at it. Um, I'd like to uh, ask Jim Kuhn, uh, who's been working with the Center of Lakes and Prairies to develop a program uh, called Restorative Actions. Uh, I don't know if Jeremy, you're able to pull up that presentation. Um, what's exciting about restorative actions is that they've uh, immersed themselves in the preparatory um, map that was uh, just discussed by uh, Pastor Stana and Rebecca. Um, the Synod of Lakes and Prairies, as you'll soon hear, has actually moved towards uh, wealth transfer. So it's not just an aspiration, it's not just a interesting idea among a bunch of progressives and anti-racist activists. Um, we're actually, they're actually moving towards um, aggregating, aggregating uh, wealth and moving to surrender that. So, Jim? Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to come up and do that. Thank you. Um, and I was uh, so I, I, I prepared some 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 words, uh, really not uh, not to be a talking head up here, but I, I think that some of the things that, uh, that that we're talking about with restorative action, some of the things that we've learned uh, uh, about the process of creating this program, uh, can be helpful for all of us uh, working toward reparation. Um, so for so restorative actions. Um, and I, for, for which I'm a volunteer, uh, believes strongly that um, that reparations are owed to Afro American and Indigenous communities for the past harms and for the persisting wealth disparities uh, that uh, that will only get bigger. Um, and while uh, while those reparations are owed at a federal level, and I, and I saw uh, one of the uh, members of the audience with uh, with William Darity's book uh, from here uh, from here to equality. Um, he, we're, we're, this is clearly something that has to be done nationally. Uh, it's uh, our thought uh, that to have that seen nationally ultimately is going to take a movement 
uh, at local levels of wealth transfer. And, uh, and, and as we looked at this, um, and we're challenging ourselves to look at it, about four years ago we recognized that there is not a facility uh, available, there's not a facility that's been approved at the IRS or legal, in, in any legal uh, uh, state level that allows a hands-free relinquishment of wealth by those who believe that and recognize that they have, they're sitting on benefit that has been denied to others. There's not a hands-free mechanism for turning over that wealth and turning it over to the communities that have been harmed. So, uh, so we have taken upon, we, we've set upon the path of creating legal mechanisms to do that. And that's the main purpose of restorative actions is to create those. We have got, uh, we have developed trusts uh, and approved them at the IRS uh, that, uh, that allow that, to, to allow those trusts to receive funds, uh, receive funds from, from white individuals, white organizations, white congregations, in a way that uh, relinquishes them, that surrenders them, that says these monies should not have been ours uh, in the first place. And so we will not uh, put our fingerprints on where the money is used. Instead, uh, we've created trustees from the uh, Afro-American uh, community and from, and we're creating a tr trustees for, set of trustees for indigenous communities that will have sole agency to determine how that, those funds are reinvested and distributed. And whether they are, rein, or whether they are distributed to organizations, to causes, to uh, individuals, to folks on the ground uh, who are not 501c3s themselves, uh, and that kind of flexibility uh, is, is what we've created in these trusts because we recognize that, that the current structure of philanthropy is very much um, unwittingly perpetuating wealth colonization. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in our goal, in, in while these, we've created these trusts and we're starting to gather funds for these trusts, it's not our intent that this is uh, that every every organization uses restorative action, but we're trying to create a model that others can use. And, and, and so we have got IRS approved documents that allow for the type of trustee relationship and the type of transfer, the type of uh, autonomy that are that's needed for these monies that are transferred in wealth. Um, for I would I, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that it, for the Afro American trust trusts um, uh, we the, the Afro American members of the restorative actions work team were the first trustees and they have recruited additional trustees including Trevor Cruz <laughs> and we're just. We are just we are just thrilled as uh, so we're working nationally. Uh, Ilona Street Stewart, who will be introducing Jim Bear Jacobs at lunch uh, this afternoon, uh, is the first uh, trustee, uh, and, and Ilona is is of uh, Indigenous Native uh, Delaware. Delaware, thank you. Uh, uh, is the first trustee within the Indigenous Trust, and we're going along the same process uh, from Ilona and those that we've spoken with in the community about how to set up the trust and what, what is needed, uh, we, will, we will start to recruit trustees for that group. The intent, because we've already collected, begin collecting money for the trust, uh, the, the intent is, in the, and actually we need to be making distributions starting this year. So, uh, so it's all happening, even though it might have started four years ago to create these things that, that had not previously existed. How much, uh, as, how much will be distributed? You've uh, accumulated a pretty large pool. Talk some about that. So the, what will be distributed is uh, not for somebody like me to say. Uh, what will be distributed will, will be up to the trustees. Uh, to date, we've collected, and we've just started, the, the trust just opened up and we have, we have not been out gathering funds until the trusts were opened because um, we found 
some white congregations didn't want to make that surrender until they could surrender to a trust. Uh, and so uh, now that they're open, we're starting to gather. We've, we've gathered uh, at this point uh, $800,000. Uh, we've got another uh, close to $200,000 that's, that's committed. Um, and, um, and so the, the, the fund. <laughs> so it's uh, it, it Traherne's uh, direction with the trustees. Uh, they will be reinvest, investing those funds and reinvesting them and distributing them, whether it's whether it is to create something that's at perpetuity or whether it is to 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 take the monies and get it out in, in, uh, in, at, at the ground level immediately. That's for them to decide. That, so I, I can't answer that question. So let's see. The um, a few things that I wanted to go over here. Uh, oh, also to say that while um, restorative actions is uh, at this point about ninety percent of the funds that we've collected to date have been from local churches, uh, in, in just a few because we've just started. Uh, it, this is not the restorative actions is not a legal is not a religious entity at all, and it has no uh, doctrinal parameters to it. It simply came out of the church, uh, and it is created as a facility because we do see uh, that in this this uh, creation of a ground swell movement to transfer wealth, we see this as a place for the churches to lead. And, uh, and, and we're finding that uh, uh, that that invitation is is being openly received. Um, let's let me talk about the wealth transfer uh, itself. Uh, for those that would consider wealth transfer, as a congregation, an individual, uh, we're we're suggesting that that transfer that they consider that transfer either immediate or plan it for the future or in their estates, whatever. Uh, would be uh, based proportionate to their own wealth, the wealth that they have, and proportionate to the racial wealth disparities that exist in America today, as, as being representative of, uh, of what that wealth should be. Um, in, to that point, uh, every three years, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, studies uh, household wealth on a on, on a racial basis and on numerous bases, the numbers that they recently published for 2022 um, show that on both a, at both a median household level and at a um, and on a uh, on an average household level, about 14 percent of the wealth held by white households and white organizations uh, is above parity. Uh, and, and so that, that is a, a, a benchmark to consider as we look at as we look at a transfer of wealth. We just want to show these these numbers briefly. I'm going to show the, the median numbers and the and the average numbers um, on a median household basis. You can see that uh, the white household wealth, uh, the gray bar on the left, <clears throat> at a median, which is like the midpoint of all half white households, uh, is two hundred eighty four thousand dollars. Uh, the, uh, the midpoint of the median wealth in Afro-American uh, households is 44, and 23,000 in uh, indigenous households, as we estimated. 80% of the population is white, and so this is going to skew the average. The average household wealth is 244. So you can so so if you look at if you look at the white household wealth at 284. And look at the forty thousand on average that's above parity. What would be fair, fair equitable distribution across all groups? It's about fourteen percent. We can go to the next slide. And thank you for doing this. This shows numbers that at, at, at an average household level, and uh, these numbers are obviously a lot larger. They 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 include the the Buffett household and the Zuckerberg household. All, all that. So these are big numbers, but what's, what is borne out is that that 14% relationship uh, is, is consistent. Uh, so for the average wealth of white households, and I'm, 
Uh, I can't say exactly, but I think about 1.36 million is the average wealth across white households in 2022. The average uh, individuals and churches to look at, uh, we're not prescribing it, but uh, that's what we would suggest they look at, uh, because it is reflective of the level of wealth that has been denied to others. I want to be real careful here. Uh, and I'm, um, uh, to, put the, to put that into context, I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, that the wealth held by these white households came out of the pockets directly of indigenous and, and Afro-American households. This is systemic. Uh, and and, and that's, where, that's where it's come from. It is more the case that that, that, wealth, that that portion of their wealth is reflective of what has been denied to, to every, everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and in fact, um, it's, it's my belief that uh, America, American households it collectively would have at least 30% more wealth today had we not uh, denied full participation in the, in the economy uh, among, among the whole 100% of, of our talent base. Um, I, I believe that firmly. I, I'm a believer in big, big numbers and statistics, and, and it's just going to be it, it, it's going to be the case. So you know, instead of the 1.171 million that is the average, if it were if wealth were distributed fairly, um, it re really would be about 1.5 million would be the household wealth in America on average across all groups uh, if, if we had fully employed our talent base um, and fully uh, gathered, gathered wealth. And I think that that's encouraging. It's, uh, it's not the reason to do reparations, but it's the reason that once we do it, I believe this country will realize that, shit, this, <laughs> we, we, if we, we, if we should have done this a long time ago. Uh, and, and, and it's just a case. Um, because prosperity is not a zero-sum game. Yes. It is not a zero-sum game. Let's take take a look at, uh, at nationally what these numbers look like. And again, I'm, I'm providing these for reference. And um, the first time this was measured, and it wasn't by the Federal Reserve at the time, it was by the University of Michigan, and they've stayed involved in the measurements through the years. The, in 1963, the wealth disparity, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back one, one slide bef before? So if, if I mentioned that the, the, on average, $189,000 is the wealth above parity for white households. If you, add, if you multiply that average <coughs> favorable disparity by 85 million white households that, that represent the population of America, uh, you get a total disparity aggregated at $16.2 trillion. $16.2 trillion. $16.2 trillion uh, as, a, as a frame of reference. Uh, the total national federal debt in the United States is, is, uh, is about twice that, $34 trillion. I might suggest that the total federal national debt in America needs to include an additional $16.2 trillion dollars uh, because it was over. And the now, U.S. GDP is 23 trillion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's, it, it, and, yes. Let's keep going back, going back to this, going back to this slide. Uh, so this shows that in, in 1963, when first measured, that instead of 16.2 trillion, we're talking about 800 billion, and that's in today's dollars. That's inflation adjusted, and you can see how it's grown, and you can see how it is. Uh, it was it was only growing. Uh, actually, the the gray line that's beneath it is how American prosperity has grown. Because wealth disparity consists of wealth, it's going to naturally grow with prosperity. So it we would naturally have expected it to have grown from 800 billion. 
up to about 9.6 trillion today, just because of the population growth and the prosperity growth in America. Instead, it's at 16.2 trillion. Uh, in, in looking at prosperity growth, it would be grow that that number has been growing about 300 billion dollars a year from from prosperity standpoint. So we would expect it to be growing until reparations are made to reset things. It will grow at at least $300 billion a year, racial wealth disparity. Instead, it's growing at $630 billion a year. So it's $630 instead of $300 billion a year is how it's growing. That's because not only is it a loss of prosperity for the Afro-American and indigenous households, it's, it's, it's an opportunity loss. That loss of prosperity creates disparate impact that holds down opportunities for, for uh, these communities. And so we, we see it rising and rising. Uh, Frank did not change in its willingness or ability to engage in the challenging work of developing authentic interracial relationships. As in the early years of unity, we do not think the racial exclusion that existed here during this time period was intentionally racist in its origins. It was more a result of being oblivious to its existence and its impact. It was a result of feeling that we were fine as we were and not wanting to change. We were reluctant to challenge the individualism that is at the core of American and Unitarian identity. We chose not to grapple with the tension between individual freedom and the need for institutional commitment to confront racism. We continue to engage in charitable works instead of initiating a deeper exploration of racism and how we might be complicit in its continued existence. That work would have forced us to feel a great deal of discomfort and to be willing to be changed. My understanding of the prophetic church is that it offers a counter narrative to the narrative of empire and colonialism. As theologian Willie Jennings often says, Jesus is not the answer to our questions. Jesus is the prophetic question to the answers that have been provided by empire. Amen. Amen. The prophetic voice, whether it's Malcolm or Martin or Mahagosananda and Thich Nhat Hanh, the prophetic voice that challenges the European white mindset, the European mind that was disembedded and somehow detached from the earth mm -hmm. and thought that it had all the answers, it knew all of the answers, though it arrives in its colonial answer mindset and looks at the land, the mountains, the forest as raw materials. Mm -hmm. It looks at indigenous groups and people as raw materials, and just as we extract raw materials for that European mindset and its needs, it extracts labor from the raw material of chattel slavery. This is the mindset to which faith communities are becoming more daring and more audacious and more prophetic in offering a counter-narrative. Chattel slavery and the beginnings of establishing what we now call racialized capitalism. This whiteness that is a distorted perception of our place in the world and our place in human history. And so I'm going back to the sacred text of Ta-Nehisi Coates, who's looking at the racial wealth gap as maybe one, if not the, pattern trait that keeps on replicating this racialized existence that we have created. And what Tanya C. Coates is asking us is both the numbers, the percentages, the housing, the redlining, looking at those things, but the spirituality of that sacred text is captured when he says the price, reparations is the price we must be willing to pay to see ourselves squared. Reparations is the price that we must pay for the revolution in American consciousness. This is the conversation that is happening at Unity Church Unitarian. 
it is our prayer and trust that it has happened in congregational ministry throughout. It is a revolution in consciousness. And the prophetic church, if anything, it has been the prophetic revolution of consciousness that rightly orders the created order of the universe. So, who would have thought? Minnesota Nice turns into the fire. Minnesota Fire sets the reparation movement forward, moves it with uh, power and grace, a commitment to real community. Um, you're witnessing uh, the emergence of a global center for reparations organizing. Who would have thunk that it would come from Minnesota? Who would have thunk that it would have come from 38th in Chicago, where a global movement for reparations emerged in response to the spectacle murder of George Floyd? Come back to Minnesota, and we will reach out to all of you all as we move forward together in our move towards uh, revolution. Thank you.